Welcome to Bits About Books, the home for conversations with authors of breakthrough books on sales, marketing and business. Founders, entrepreneurs and individual professionals, we all need to keep track of ideas that are helping create our today and tomorrow. Bits About Books will strive to find those books and speak to their authors, go behind the scenes and understand what inspired the authors to write the books that they did and how they went about doing so. Through our conversations, we hope to gain insights that will help us to get the most out of our efforts. I'm your host Shubhanjan Sarkar, founder of Pitchlink, the next generation buyer-seller engagement platform where our mission is to make buying easy. Welcome to Bits About Books. Thank you for your time and for joining us in this session. I have a favor to ask. While you continue to listen to the podcast, please leave a comment or rating at iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts from. I personally look at each comment and will give you a shout out to each of you in our following episodes. It means a lot to hear from you. Our guest today is Ted Olson and we speak with him about his new book, Feel Good About Selling, Increase Your Sales, Keep Your Integrity. By the way, I love cold calls. I, I use them as training opportunities because I want to see how they're doing. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I've had people almost break down in tears, like trying to get through their, their script. And I said, hey, hey, let me just stop you there. Can I, do you want some tips? Can I, can I just give you a little bit of coaching? And like, oh, please, which goes back to leadership. There are not enough good leaders, especially sales leaders who can, or who are equipping their people to, to have business conversations. Ted Olson is the author of Feel Good About Selling, a book written to help people feel good about selling and to avoid the bad habits that hurt sales. He has trained thousands of salespeople from all different backgrounds and industries. He uses his sales experience to help individuals and organizations with sales, sales enablement, sales training, demand generation and marketing. He has built sales teams that have broken every record at their respective companies. He has created a unique sales framework and methodology called PEP, which stands for Positioning, Exploring and Presenting. PEP offers a flexible approach based on core selling principles for anyone in sales, whether they like selling or not. When not at work, Ted practices martial arts and homeschools his four kids with his wife, Nicole. They have two dogs, oatmeal and honeybee, and a guinea pig, pinball. His kids wanted him to add this last part about the pets. Now, on to this discussion from the heart with Ted Olson. Ted, welcome to Bits About Books. I am delighted to have you on the show, uh, not only because this is our first, first meeting, but also because I, I totally dig the tone and the philosophy of your book. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. All right. Glad to be here. Thank you, uh, Shivanjan. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. When did you think that you needed to write this book? Yeah. Um, so it's such a good question. So what I realized is a lot of sales books, not all of them, but a lot of them, most of them are written by salespeople for salespeople. Hmm. And so there was a lot of assumptions that were being made. And what I think that folks in sales often miss is that there's a whole group of people that need to sell, want to sell, but don't like the, um, you know, to quote that movie we, we talked about earlier, mm. um, always be closing mindset, that sort of toxic masculinity, that um, over assertiveness, that drive. And it just, it doesn't feel right with them. And as I was doing my research, I found a whole group of people that have wonderful solutions that can help so many people, but they aren't able to articulate it. And they turn to, you know, the sales community and they don't like what they're hearing. And so I said, I think there's an opportunity here to actually reframe selling to what it's really meant to be. Let's serve others. Let's help other people hmm. and not get caught up in all of this um, toxic masculinity sales tactics, manipulation and pressure. Let's strip all that out of it and just be human beings helping another human being. 
how does it translate from your day job where you where you are where you in this transaction and environment uh, how, 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 what triggered actually i i can imagine that some of these discussions some of these interactions might have triggered some of these thoughts uh, can you recollect any of those so i have the the privilege of working for what i think is the best company in the world the predictive index and my particular role is i'm a consultant to consultants hmm. so i help our I, i enable our partner network who are world class consultants to position themselves in the market to have great consulting conversations and to service their customers with really powerful solutions from their own existing services but also the tools of the predictive index and that is where i really discovered wow these folks are brilliant um but they 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 struggle on the sales front and their um and that's why i actually realized hey there's a lot of folks who need to sell want to sell but don't have good tools that feel right to them and so the book came out a lot came from that um but i've also been selling since i was 17 so um i'm sort of drawing in my life's journey in my own journey which was a struggle i didn't i don't like pressure tactics i don't like manipulating people that doesn't feel good to me um i want to treat people with dignity and respect but i didn't know how to do that in a sales context because all of the sales advice on the market is so um i would say outdated would be a kind way of saying it right right i i couldn't agree with you more uh, and uh, th- that discussion we can have at a separate time um so once you thought that this book book has to come out what did you do next what what was your process uh yeah it's um shivanjan that's such a great question and i i wish i had like this this perfect scenario of, hey here's how you write a book and here's how you get your ideas out there i didn't i stumbled along it took me 2 years um but what i did do is i tapped into my network and i worked with others and said hey um here's my idea and i got confirmation on the idea it's like yes people need that business owners customer service centers even sales people who are um sort of caught in this ba- all of these bad habits that are hurting them and hurting their brand and reputation so many people need this fresh approach so one was to get confirmation that this idea is valid another was to actually sit down and do it and i didn't sit down and say hmm how can i help people feel good about selling i started to just write and i wrote for every day so when the when the pandemic hit i was no longer commuting so that freed up 2 hours i wrote for an hour every morning for months and months and i wrote and wrote and wrote and then i go back and oh, i've got to throw all this out and i would go again again and again i changed the title of my book four times um and it was my wife thankfully who said ted you are trying to write two books don't do that you have one killer idea land that and that really helped me center in and focus in on my audience the basic in my audience is people who aren't crazy about selling if you're not crazy about selling because it doesn't feel good this might help you and when i got that everything fell into place in the book the year, it was like a year and a half of scr- struggling 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 and then 6 months boom it just all fell together it's a little bit of the journey i'm not sure if that answered your question yeah yeah absolutely it does and uh, and it's triggering a lot of interesting questions in my head the first one is which was the other book that you were also writing mm uh so it was it, i was going down two paths one was like here's a new here's a new sales system mm and like like a methodology and i realized wow that's going to corner me pretty pretty lock me into a, a box and i don't like that mm. and what i realized as i started to chase my focus which was you know folks who aren't crazy about selling doesn't feel good to them that's when all of the principles of selling started to surface like mm. treating people with dignity and respect big principle putting your customer first another big principle um helping somebody on a journey another really big principle so i started to slide these 
principles into place and I realized this is better than my hmm. sort of tactical sales system. You still need that. But I realized that this was the, the book that needs to be written first. I may go back and go a little sure. deeper in other areas. Sure. But this was the one that needed to come out first um, for the folks who, and by the way, the research I've done is 40 to 50% of the people that I talk to don't feel good about selling. Mm. That's a lot of sellers out there who aren't feeling great about it. It's uncomfortable, doesn't feel right, it feels icky, they want to take a shower. You know, after it's, you know, it's like, I don't want to say that, and I want to change all of that. I want people to join a movement hmm. of non-salesy selling. Let's transition sales into trusted advisors. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, very interestingly, I just wanted to add one anecdotal uh, bit here. So I have lots of friends in LinkedIn like you uh, hmm. have uh, who are very vocal about cold calling and cold uh, cold mailing and 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 in good in good way i mean uh, they're they're fine uh, very good people uh, however when i ask them how many times do you pick up a cold call mm. that's a question they mostly can't answer by the way i love cold calls <laughs> I, I use them I mean, as training opportunities because i want to see how they're doing and i'm like oh yeah. okay yeah. Hmm. And I've had people almost break down in tears, like trying to get through their, their script. And I said, hey, hey, let me just stop you there. Can I, do you want some tips? Hmm. Can, I, can I just give you a little bit of coaching? And like, oh, please. Which goes back to leadership. There are not enough good leaders, yeah. especially sales leaders, yeah. who, can, or who are equipping their people to, to have business conversations. They're just not doing it. They're just Absolutely. trying to get something. I agree. Um, and and by the way, that's what reflects in the fact that uh, average VP of sales today has a tenure of 18 months. Great point. And when, when you are living in that uncertainty mm. at a very senior level, which means you have responsibility, family, children, so on and so forth. And you know that this might be 18 months gig for me. Exactly. Which, uh, I, you know, as I, I and I've written about this before, which is you know, ABC, always be closing, is a great line in a movie. It's a really bad sales approach. I totally agree. I totally agree. It's a really, it's a really <laughs> poor sales mindset. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Always be helping. Hmm. I'm good with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. So coming back to the process. So you shifted focus uh, and, you, and you zeroed down on this path. And then this principles sort of surfaced. I am imagining from the chapters that or, or pieces that you're already written mm -hmm. as a part of this this process how did you then finally structure this book how, how did you get to this five part uh, structure yeah so uh, th it's three part structure Sorry, so yeah, yeah three parts I am a I am a big fan of simplicity Mm. Um, and I love triangles and I love the rule of three and triadic theory and sort of mm. geek out on stuff like that. Um, and I was over the course of about three years, I've learned, well, let me put it, let me back up a little bit. Since the time I was 17, I've been selling and I've learned probably three sort of well-known, maybe you know, four well-known sales methodologies. And I would say I probably reached, you know, Pro, uh, professional level and some of them proficient in others. Hmm. Uh, and then I just realized, wow, it's all so complicated and it's, I can't remember what step I'm on. And by the way, my, my prospect isn't at that step that I want them to be at. And I sort of feel like I, I write about this in the book where I'm trying to lasso my prospect into my, my, my system and my path. Hmm. And it wasn't working. And so that's when the idea of the principles came into play. And I could break it into three. Uh, number one, positioning. Positioning is all about how do you actually move somebody from attention to interest? How do you get their attention? How do you get their interest in talking to you? That's positioning. And prospecting falls under that. Hmm. The next one is exploring. How do you actually take somebody's interest and then have a business conversation to get buy-in? How do you actually see if there's a there there to see if and how you can help your prospect 
or not. So that's part two. So the P is positioning, the E is exploring, and the second P, I'm sorry, the third P is presenting, which is actually the smallest part. That's presenting a solution for ownership. And it happens just to make the, the fun acronym of PEP. So PEP, selling, positioning, exploring, and presenting. Right. So so, so let's, let's switch to the book now. Uh, the book does have five parts, right? Because I'll just remind you, the first one is rethinking sales, and that may not be the uh, operational. Oh, that's part right. Of- you're you're right. Sorry, I misunderstood. So my, the sales system only has three yeah, parts. The I book, know. I break it into five. You're right. No, no, I, I got that. No, no, no problem. Now, applying the sales principles in your context. Let's touch upon this. You did touch upon it a bit, but let's let's touch upon it a little more. Why do we need to rethink sales? Why do we need to rethink sales? Is a great question. I think because sales has lost its way. I think that there are not enough leaders out there talking about what sales is truly meant to be, which is the journey to help somebody make a positive change. So think about that. Sales is the process of helping somebody get to a better place. And there's a missing, uh, like if you ask people to find sales, they will say, oh, it's a transaction, finding pain, um, you know, uh, providing a solution. And all of those are sort of right, but it's not complete. And I think when we think about sales, we need a complete picture. And it is very much a process of helping somebody make a positive change, but allowing them to own it. The prospect needs to make that decision. And too often, I think that we have been taught in the sales tactics and techniques that are out there in the marketplace, essentially put you in the position of forcing somebody down that path rather than guiding them and inviting them. We are supposed to be the trusted guides, the trusted advisor. Um, Think of it as a story. So in story, you have a hero, a guide, and a villain. And this comes from, like, check out Donald Miller, check out Nancy Duarte, check out, um, uh, oh, go go back to Aristotle, go back to um, Seneca. I mean, they're all talking about this sort of journey. Mm. Um, The big one is the hero's journey from... Uh, I can't remember his name. I should remember his Joseph Campbell. Hmm. So this idea of, um, I think salespeople have put themselves in the wrong part of the movie. You're playing the wrong part. You're trying to be the hero, close the deal, win. Well, that's actually the hero's journey. It's actually our job as the trusted guide to be like Mr. Miyagi and help Daniel battle the villains of Cobra Kai. Right? Or... Yoda helping Luke Skywalker knock out the Death Star and battle the, the, the Empire, mm. right? And I think we've lost, we've lost that message. So that's why I think we need to rethink what sales even is. Do you think partially it could be because one of the points that we are missing is most of the sales tactics that we are using, the, the whole pressure tactics, you know, manipulation, Mm. whatever we talk of, things that people really don't feel good about. Mm -hmm. They are part of the industrial era uh, uh, legacy where we first figured out a way to mass produce stuff and then we had to go out and find people who have to take it, right? So it's like if I don't sell out this 100,000 pieces of whatever, Mm -hmm. my factory will stop, which means my investment in that will go and my workers will be sitting you get the drift. However, we are selling to a completely different generation of buyers having completely different needs mm. and different abilities. Uh, do you think there is some connection there? I think that's a great question. I think that's a, a um, I think there's a book in there. <laughs> I think you could probably trace. Um, and I think people have written about this, like maybe Seth Godin have sort of touched on this journey of, of what has happened um, in the industrialization of just about everything. And of course, sales is, is dragged along in that, um, which was always meant to actually help people solve a problem, right? Um, I think the, the part that, that I address in the book especially is related to the, the ideas around masculinity and toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. 
Hmm. I think there's a lot of maleness in sales yeah. that we need to actually remove because those aren't good things. It's it's like hard hitting. Um, it's the grinder. It's the, um, the the person who crushed that deal. It's like that language. <laughs> that language is um, that's violent. And sales yeah. is about helping people. And I think we need to bring that back in and get back to actually serving others to help them get to where they want to go versus serving ourselves to drive our numbers. And when we do that, I think it actually starts to perpetuate and it starts to actually get to far greater places you can get to virally because you're treating people better than with force and, and might is right. Um, I think we need to get back to human to human. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the amount of war imagery in the terminology that we use in sales mm. is is not funny. And I can I can also imagine that they might have started off by by being relevant for your competitors, but somewhere it veered and became the customer. Mm. Uh, uh, that, that's that's my interpretation of <laughs> of the war imagery. Uh, it started with competitors, but somehow. The, the customer himself became our competitor. Yeah, and I think we spend a lot of time arguing with our prospects. It's like, why, yeah. would, you, why would you argue with your hero? Right, that doesn't make any sense. You, you could certainly challenge them, right, to think differently, invite them to, to take a step, but, but argue with them? Um, you, know, so, you know, one of the things that I, I coach salespeople with, it, they say things like, well, don't you want to save 25%? It's like, that's such a stupid question, right? It's so threatening. Why, why would you do that? Why would you say something like that? Uh, and it's because they, they don't know a different way. They don't know what they don't know. They only mm. know the, these, these bad habits that have been brought mm. forward and carried through the industrial engine of sales. Um, and it just hasn't been, there haven't been enough voices speaking up with new approaches and methods that actually work much more effectively. Absolutely. In fact, one of the things I, uh, I I I repeat a lot of times when I'm talking in various forums is that one of the biggest myths that we have perpetuated is that salespeople close deals. Mm. Not a single deal in history, according to me, has been closed by salespeople. Every single deal has been closed by the buyer because if he didn't sign, there was no deal. Yeah, that's the that's the um, sales is the process of helping someone make it a, a positive change and allowing them to own it. They have to make that decision. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. So moving on, uh, uh, talking about the book, uh, let's let's dig in a little bit into the framework, the PEP framework. L let's talk a bit about positioning, exploring, and presenting. Each each one of those. What what do you present? And what should readers be looking out for? Yeah, so uh, let's start with positioning. I think that most people don't get their position in the story right. I think that uh, when I see, when I'm looking at sellers, I see them talking about, uh, I say, you're talking about you, your product, and your company. And your buyer doesn't care. What they care about is how you can help them solve their problem. So your position is already off. I look at your website, you're talking about, oh, you're the number one data center. What? No one cares. How, can you help me solve my problem? That's what I want to know as a buyer. So the, the first big principle I try to get across is this is not about you. You are not the hero of the story and you don't want to be. You actually want to be the trusted guide because you're the sage. You're the person who has wisdom an information that can help affect positive change in someone's life. So positioning is, and when you get it wrong, by the way, it, it impacts everything. Your prospecting starts to sound salesy. Your website sounds salesy. Your LinkedIn posts sound salesy because you've got, your, you've got the story wrong. Your LinkedIn, if you're talking about creating demand, should be about talking the, about the problem that you solve for your particular audience. Um, so positioning is, everyone does it. Most people get it wrong. And I, I did some research on this, um, light research. So like, not like, I don't know how much it will hold up to scrutiny. But I saw a post 
that said, tell me what you do in five words or less. And I went through the post. It was over like a, I, I think I wrote about it. I'm pretty sure I wrote about it. It was like 60 to 100 answers. And I read each one. And I said, of, of those, did they tell me what they do for me, the buyer? Only like 20, uh, uh only like 25% came close. Only 15% said, I know exactly what you do for me. So think about that. That's positioning. If you can only, you, basically you've got the world's best marketers out there and only 15% of them are actually positioning themselves in such a way that me, the buyer, knows what you do for me. Because it's all about me, 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 me as the buyer. And as salespeople in organizations, we keep talking about us, 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 and it's not going to land. So the big takeaway, not about you. It's time for a short break. Stay with us. After the break. So when I ask people what they do, what's the first thing? They say, oh, I'm a consultant. It's like, that doesn't tell me anything, right? Uh, you need to give me a little more than that. And certainly from a, um, they often go to their title. If they don't go to their title, they'll go to their company. Oh, I work for such and such. And I think what we need to get to is like really in your face, what problem do you solve for me, right? So you could take a simple example like a hairdresser. Does a hairdresser cut hair? Sure, but a hairdresser might make me feel younger, right? And I need that with the little hair that I have. You are listening to a Business Podcast Network original. Podcasting is the fastest growing content marketing opportunity, which is untapped. We can help you craft your audio strategy and help leverage the wide reach and easy streaming capability that the smartphone penetration provides. It is easy, it is powerful and personal. Talk to us to find out how podcasting can help you build your brand and reach out to your targets like never before. Write to us at bpn at bizcast.in that is bpn at biz C-A-S-T dot I-N. Business Podcast Network. Podcasts end to end. Welcome back. I'm Shubhanjan Sarkar, your host for Bits About Books and founder of Pitchlink, the buyer-seller engagement platform. Let's dive right back into the episode where we left it. Once you have got your, and, and getting the positioning right is very tough, by the way. I mean, mm. I, I, I can totally imagine, partially it's the mindset issue. Uh, yeah, explain it a bit. So I'll, I'll put my question. So, so yes, it is very much a mindset shift to say to realize that in sales it's not about you because a lot of times sales is touted as you know you're you're in charge, it's autonomous, and and that's true. Um, there's autonomy, but the professional sellers, the trusted yeah. advisor sellers, they know it's not about them. They know that they are people who can help people get to where they want to go. Hmm. Um, Dale Carnegie talk, was talking about this in 1936, uh, where he was like, hey, salespeople, if you can just show us how you can help us solve our problem, you won't need to sell us. We will buy. Hmm. Um, and that is um, essentially an anchor for me. Um, so I talk a lot about mindset in positioning, but then I shift to the framework that helps you do it. Hmm. So in the book, we'll give you the tools where you can actually begin to really rethink um, what you do in the marketplace. Hmm. So when I ask people what they do, what's the first thing? Oh, they say, oh, I'm a consultant. It's like, that doesn't tell me anything, right? Uh, uh, you need to give me a little more than that. And certainly from a, um, they often go to their title. If they don't go to their title, they'll go to their company. Oh, I work for such and such. And I think what we need to get to is like really in your face, what problem do you solve for me, right? So you could take a simple example like a hairdresser. Does a hairdresser cut hair? Sure, but a hairdresser might make me feel younger, right? And I need that with the little hair that I have, right? Um, a landscaper, do, do they just cut grass or do they save me time? Hmm. That's a problem solved. Or do they help me keep up with the Joneses? Maybe that's important to me. I don't know, hmm. right? So tapping into what matters to your buyer is so important. And I will quote my, just as an aside, I've been interviewing the younger generation hmm. to see how they're buying. And my daughter put it in two, two phrases. Um, 
I'll, I can put it in one phrase. Show it to me fast. That's your new buyer. Next generation of buyers. Show me fast. Because she's like, I don't use Google anymore. I, I'm probably off on a tangent here. She's like, I, I will never go to Facebook unless I have to. But when I'm looking for information, I don't want to read your blog post. I don't want to watch your 30 minute video. I'll watch TikTok or I'll search for it on Instagram and get exactly what I want. So there's a, there's a whole world of change and a whole world of hurt that is coming soon if we don't really recognize the shifts that are taking place in the marketplace. So to get back to your, your initial question, um, that mindset shift is going to be critical, but then you have to have a framework that's going to allow you to articulate not with cleverness or cuteness or anything like that. All that does is confuse crystal clear clarity. How do you help me? I think this is so powerful because as you, as you mentioned a bit earlier, most of it is actually pretty simple, right? It's Occam's razor, but, but we don't like to believe that. Mm-hmm. If it is that simple, everybody would have done it. But nobody does there, it. There's a, um, there's a, um, my wife and I, we walk our dogs in our neighborhood yeah. just about every night. Yeah. And there's, there's a, um, a, a driveway seal coater. You know, the people who seal coat your driveway and put, make it look nice and seal it up for the winter. And he has one sign and it's everywhere. And he tells you exactly what he does for you. And it's Dennis's basic seal coating. That's his message. And he's all over my town because he just tells you exactly what he does for you. Nothing more, nothing less. Simple, to the point, not confusing. Here's the phone number. Not even a website. Here's the phone number. So you know what he does and you know what you should do. Um, So anyway, I I always use that as an example. Just keep it simple. That's a great, great example. Not, Not only because what you just said. I mean, maybe you also meant this. But when you say basic you know it's a no-frills pricing as well. Exactly. Yep. It's the, a whole, the whole message is in there. Wonderful. So after you have done your positioning, it's time mm-hmm. to explore. So what are you exploring? Are you exploring your buyer's requirements? Or are you? what are you doing there? Yeah, I think that... So let, let's put talk about what we know, what's common in the marketplace, which is got to get to the pain, got to get to the pain, got to get to the pain, which is true. Um, but there's always there's this idea of like getting information. Hmm. And what happens is when I listen to sales calls, I'm like, wow, you sound like you're interrogating them, you know, because you're just hmm. trying to collect information to then pitch. Hmm. You're not really listening. You're not having um, a human to human conversation. Yeah. And more importantly, and perhaps most importantly, you're not creating a safe environment. Hmm. So in my the, the way that I think about it, and this isn't for everybody, um, is that the first thing you need to do is you need to create a safe environment. Well, how do you do that, right? How do you actually have a safe conversation with someone so that you can actually have the business conversation, ask the harder questions, create the space so they'll open up and share with you? Um, Those things are not taught, just not. I mean, I'm talking about active listening, talking about setting expectations, I'm talking about putting people at ease, Um, I'm not talking about not making assumptions, asking open-ended questions, putting yourself in the vulnerable seat, putting yourself in the learner's position, uh, is not talked about very much. Hmm. Um, I think more and more of it's coming to market, but exploring is first about creating a safe environment so you can actually have a rich business conversation. So, uh, Ted, I'm, I'm curious, uh, one, one reason that that doesn't fly in current uh, environment is because we are all after our quarterly targets, right? And this looks like a patient process. It can't be impatient, instant coffee kind of process, right? Uh, so that's that's sort of the put off that while I know that I should create this safe space and uh, create this safe mental space where somebody mm. feels comfortable that, okay, if I tell this to Ted or tell this to Shubhanjan, he's not immediately going to pounce and start pitching to me. Uh, how do you actually do that? I mean, listening, I, I mean, I, you did mention the tools, but how does it, how does it actually happen from, mm. from the buyer's point of view? Can you, 
can you imagine and uh, sort of explain that for sure uh, I, can i back up for one moment sure i, I want to just address the, the question that you mentioned that a lot of people are just looking for quick 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 there's some truth to that but context matters so some industries let's go all the way to the other end of the spectrum some industries require discovery that's months long so that's paid discovery a lot of sales people aren't even thinking about that so I've, i was on an engagement recently where we did uh 60 days paid discovery because we had to get deep into that organization to figure out mm. what was happening and we were paid for that time because it was a lot of work mm. um others go swing all the way to the, to the other end which is just show me right just the demo just show me the demo mm. and i think w w what i'm getting at here is you're ex setting the right expectations for your context matters where i can tell you the so if we bundle the middle which is sort of the big hump in the sales world mm. what they do is they set expectations for a show and tell and it sounds like this they'll say something like oh i'd love to set up some time and show you what we can do for you right well guess what expectation you just set right number one what you wanted right number two a show and tell which puts you in number three a uh a, you you just made yourself a commodity you didn't sell a business conversation you didn't say um uh something like hey shivanjan i'm, I'm not sure that I, i'd be able to help um, but if you're open to it, should we sit down and have a conversation about what matters to you and your organization, or should I just get out of your hair? Right? That, that's respectful. That I'm setting myself up to have a conversation with you. Um, if I get that conversation, now I'm going to run my script. I'm going to, I'm going to run my, my bullet points where I'm going to, um, run a four step process that I outline in depth in the book that gives you the tools to lay out that safe environment so you can have that conversation. That conversation can be as fast as 20 minutes. And then you can show them a little bit of how you can solve their problem and get that next step. Um, or that conversation could be an hour. I can tell you that I had a discovery conversation not too long ago where I asked my opening question. And... Um, this individual talked for 25 minutes straight. And I just, I nodded. I said, I'm just taking notes, nodded, uh-huh, mm -hmm. kept going, kept going. And I said, well, we're at our allotted time. Um, should I just give you like a 60 second overview of what I think might be a decent next step? I did that. So I asked one discovery question. I did that. And the individual said, yeah, let's do it. Sign me up. So it's it's always really interesting when you get when you get when you create that space and they just yeah. dump. Yeah, I I I totally I totally understand where that is coming from and uh, because a lot of times when and I'm not talking of a very complex buy where multiple people are involved and a lot right. of work has already gone in, but if it's sort of like a mid-range kind of thing, something worth a couple of maybe maybe like less than 20 10 20 thousand dollars that's a decision you can take literally sure uh, you are really looking for assurance that a this person knows what he's talking about and b will be transparent enough to say what he can do or cannot do right and you are looking for those indications it's it's uh, and and if if that that is not coming through then you are holding back so, so it's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing, but it is. Yeah, the framework I use is called pain, power, and a plan. Mm. Are you able to get to and pain? My, the, my definition of pain is what matters to my prospect. Mm. Uh, power. Are you talking to the right person? And if you're not, that's okay. Do they see you as a potential solution? Because if they do, now you can work together to figure out how you can make them successful. Yeah, yeah. Right, and yeah. then plan. Can you get a plan forward to get to any kind of a next step hmm. uh, rather than, I think, uh, rather than forcing it? Can you work collaboratively to get to the next step? So pain, power, and a plan is typically the reason most deals fall apart. You didn't show enough commercial value to, to your solution because you didn't get under the surface, and so you couldn't make the connection. 
power, you weren't talking to the right person to begin with. Hmm. And plan, you're, you, you scared them away. You, you didn't have a clear path to their success. And if you do that, especially today, you're, you're just not going to close deals. People do not want to take risks. They, they do not want to make a mistake. They would rather stay doing nothing with what they know than risking a change which could make them look bad. Shame. Shame is a big driver that we are not fully understanding as uh, trusted advisors or sales professionals. I, I agree totally. Let's move on to presentation piece and tell us a bit more about what you what you covered there. Yeah, so presenting is what most people think of when they think of selling. They think of that person who's super persuasive, mm. can talk a dog off a meat wagon, right? Mm. They're, you know, Mr. or Mrs. or non-gender personality, right? They're just, mm. they're that loud, talkative salesperson. And that is abhorrent to most people especially mm. buyers, uh, what you really want to be throughout the sales cycle is like cool hand Luke, right? Cool, calm, and collected. Um, a non-anxious presence. A, um, I've had people say to me, Ted, when you do your sales training, why are you so serious? I'm like, because this isn't the time uh, for you to... Um, people, a lot of people think that passion Sales is the trans, transmission of passion mm. and stuff like that. It's not. Sales is the trans um, the transmission of power. You are empowering somebody to do something they weren't able to do. And so they're like, where's all your enthusiasm that you, you know, when you talk about sales, you light up. But when you get into a sales motion, you, you suddenly become subdued. It's like, well, think about it. If you sat down with your therapist, would you want them to be all excited and animated? Or would you want them to be, to have a non-anxious presence? Um, so calm, assertive is the way to be throughout the sales process, not this loud, talkative salesperson. And I think that what I outline in the book is when you are, when you're in the presentation mode, this is about tying uh, what's happening in your prospect situation to your solution and to see if there's a there there. And I think most people get that. Some people just don't do it. They, they sort of maybe dance around the bush a little bit. Mm. Um, do, uh, I could tell you a quick story to, to illustrate this. Sure. So stories are great, right? So I hired, I hired a landscaper to come and put um, shrubs in front of my house. And I said, you know, just give me a price, let me know. And he came back, you know, a couple of days later and said, here's a price for a spring cleanup. I'm like, okay, well, what about the shrubs? He's like, oh, I'll have to get back to you. So do you think he got the job? No, because that wasn't, I didn't want a spring cleanup. I needed to know about my shrubs. Hmm. So what he did is he looked at my yard and my yard was a mess. I mean, a, a disaster. Um, I have four kids, two dogs, and I homeschool. Hmm. So um, he didn't know that I was actually okay with a messy yard. I want my kids out there running around in bare feet. I don't care about my lawn. I don't care about anything like that. I want them digging holes. And by the way, I have four rakes, and I'm happy. I can happily put four rakes in their hands, and we can do a spring cleanup together. No problem doing that. Mm -hmm. What I don't know, Mr. Landscaper, and what I asked you to help me with, is shrubs. The only thing I know about shrubs comes from the scene in Monty Python about <laughs> shrubbery. That's it. So I don't know how deep to plant them, what their names are, whether they should get sun, water. Had you helped me solve that problem, I would have purchased, I would have bought. So I think that I, I, I really make sure to, that when you are in presentation mode, that you are tying that to what matters to your prospect and making sure you've got a direct connection, nothing vague, be very specific, always going back to that. The other that I emphasize is um, this idea of casting vision. So the language that we want to use is not, not um, which is pretty common, like, oh, this is great. This is great. This is so cool. When you, you often hear that, what we want to talk about is you want to say something like, hey, Shivanjan, this will, this will enable you to X, going right back to your problem. This provides you the ability to why. 
Um, we always want to go back to that because what it does, that language casts vision of the new future that you could have should we decide to work together. So if you decide to work with me in a, a sales arena, sales and marketing position, whatever it is, you would have the ability to do these three things. And I would tell you whatever those three things are based on our context. And then the last one is the one that trips everyone up and everyone pushes back on, which is allowing you to own it. You have to let your prospect make that decision, exactly what you said earlier. And so it sounds awkward when, when, I, when I say it to the ears of a traditional salesperson. But actually, when you tell someone who wants to sell but doesn't like selling, they're like, oh, I love that, right? And it sounds like this. It's like, um, so this would give you the ability um, to do X and Y. Does this seem like it would be helpful in your context or am I off base? Right, they have that you want to put yourself in that vulnerable position or did I miss the mark? Am I barking up the wrong tree? Am I fishing without a hook? Put yourself in that vulnerable position because guess what will happen? It'll make your prospect feel safe and feel safe to push back to tell you what is important or to take ownership of it. No, I love this, Ted. Let's do it. Yeah, very few sense. people are. Yeah, very few people are comfortable um, giving giving them the ownership. It's not taught. I mean, we grow we grow up sort of thinking that getting a no is a bad thing. Yeah, it, it happens when we are we are little in school. Mm. So I think it sort of gets ingrained, and when you are in this constant sort of interaction with people who can say no to you, you are hedging against that as far as you can. That potentially is one of the reasons why we do that. I I don't know. You you know better than me <laughs> on this one. Oh, for sure. And I, I like your word there. Um, I think salespeople go above and they, they try to do everything possible to hedge against that no. But a professional sales person, a trusted advisor will go for it. I think Absolutely. David Sandler called it "Go for No." I think it was him. Uh, um, "Go for No" is Andrea Walls. Oh, is it? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, she wrote so a, yeah, she wrote a book on no. this. Yeah, oh, yeah. Did she? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she wrote uh, a book on that called "Go for No." Yeah. The sooner uh, you know, the better. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. I. I mean, it's so much time wasted behind things which you'd anyway turn no, but you had no mm. idea at the beginning and you kept pushing that no. Right. The faster you figure out, you can move on to better, more interesting things. So before we wrap up, uh, Ted, I just want to touch upon this applying the principles in context. So question is that you do say that this, this application may differ based on the context of what you're selling. So can you give a quick sort of uh, example of how it might, how, how it might differ? Sure. Um, so it differs because it's principle based. So I think that is it effective in B two B for sure, but it's effective in B two C in any other any other selling environment channel. I mean, I, I've been in. Um, I started in B two C, moved into B two B, moved into channel, um, and it's effective in all of those. So the differentiator. So unlike traditional approaches that have like, hey, here's here's how you qualify. Well, that doesn't work in this environment. That's just awkward, right? Bant is like trying to insert bant onto, onto somebody. It's like, that's not going to matter. Like in a SaaS, you don't need, budget is an issue in a SaaS environment. It's 10 grand for crying out loud. You don't need to ask the budget question. It's, is there a need there, right? It's different. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm embellishing to make a point. Uh, I think what matters, uh, Shivanjan, is that we really have to get back to the roots of selling and the principles of selling because it transcends any environment. If you can be someone who is safe, if you can be someone who is seen as trusted, if you are someone who can provide value, uh, if you are someone who can solve their problem, I mean, let's get back to basics and and really unpack that. I'm actually working on some LinkedIn posts right now that asks 
three simple questions that will do more than any sales tactics ever would. Right? Just ask yourself, what are your sales principles? What matters to you? Why do you sell? Right? Um, and I just don't think that we're asking those questions. And what's happening is we're hurting people and we're ticking people off and we're tarnishing reputations and, and we're losing business because we're forgetting that on the under, and other end of that message is a human being with feelings and emotions and a life to live. And I think when we get back to principles and actually incorporate that, those principles into the system, well, now it becomes flexible, right? Now it becomes, oh, my principle here is to create a safe environment. How you do that is entirely up to you. I, have, I know a, a consultant who finds out what kind of music you like before you talk to them. And they have that music playing when you get on a call with them. That's pretty good, right? Because they want you to feel comfortable. Um, so anyway, that's a, a, that's a little bit of, of why I think the principles matter uh, over the over the industry, over the over the selling environment. Uh, because once you nail the principles, well, now you can. Now you've got a superpower. You can be super flexible anywhere you go. You can use it with your kids, your spouse, right? Uh, it, it, it makes total sense uh, because it's, it's really, really what you should be doing and not how you do it is the, is the point. Staying safe while climbing a tree will be different from staying safe while climbing a mountain. Mm -hmm. As long as you're staying safe, I think we are good. Yeah, I, my, my hope is, uh, Shivanjan, is if I, that, I, that I struck that balance that allows people to take those principles and adapt it to their context. I'm not going to clamp a system down on sure. you. Use these principles. Yeah. Um, and it's it's new. So I, I haven't seen anybody doing it. Hmm. And when I'm in environments of training people, I will say, okay, that was your choice of how to do that. Did we get the outcomes? Hmm. And it's like, okay, you got it here, but we didn't get this one and this one. How do we do that? And they go back to it and they adjust and like, oh, that, that feels right to me. Hmm. And that's just the best feeling when somebody says that feels right to me. Because now they have confidence. Now they have, um, now they feel good to actually go out and help people. Rather than sell people, let's go out and help people. Bits About Books is brought to you by Pitchlink, the buyer-seller engagement platform. Pitchlink makes buying easy by enabling high quality engagement between buyers and sellers through its presentation and discussion modules. Sellers create customized sales narratives using sales collaterals and personal videos and reach out to prospects through a non-intrusive buyer-qualified engagement. Pitchlink requires no installation or download and holds the entire repository of sales collaterals and buyer-seller conversations. Talk to us to know more about how you can engage with customers without intrusion. Call us on 990216313232. Wonderful, Ted. This was a great session. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think the, the biggest point that you make is we somehow believe that philosophy is impractical. Mm. And <laughs> I think this no, whole that's the session, foundation. <laughs> this whole whole session actually sort of turns it on its head. My, my peer, who, one of my peers who, who read my book early on said, Ted, I've never seen someone take abstract philosophical ideas and then boom, bring it right down to the road. And you've, you've bridged that. So it, it, was, it was a nice compliment. Of course. Uh, this, was, uh, this was great. Yeah, thank you. It was great to chat with you. Absolutely. We have a fantastic lineup over the next couple of episodes with great conversations on breakthrough books. Subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you do not miss a single episode. Thanks for listening. Thank you for being with us today on Bits About Books, where we talk to authors about breakthrough books on sales, marketing and business. We hope this conversation helped inform and motivate as we all navigate a rapidly changing business environment. For us, these are enlightening conversations enriched with knowledge and expertise. We encourage you to go out and buy the book to learn firsthand and implement some of the great ideas we discussed today. We hope to have you with us again in the next exciting episode of Bits About Books. 
If you liked what you heard, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast platforms like iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcast from, and give us a rating while you are at it. This Bizcast original podcast is produced for Pitchlink, the next generation buyer seller engagement platform, where the mission is to make buying easy. Hosted by Subhanjan Sarkar and produced by Rajiv Aditya. See you next time and have a wonderful day.